Okay, welcome everybody with this first um, Beyond the Standard Model session. Uh, so today's session will be mostly focusing on like, you know, extended Higgs sectors, Higgs boson production, uh, pair production, and also supersymmetry. And so um, I will keep the speakers to 15 minutes. Uh, so I will let you know when there's like, you know, five minutes left or so. And so um, I, I will try to do it by annotating on your slides. So it's a little bit less disturbing. But okay, so even though, um, yeah, I think people are still joining, I think for the schedule, we should probably get started uh, with Linghua's talk on the Higgs boson pair production. So Linghua, please uh, get started whenever you're ready. Hello, uh, this is Linghua. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you very clearly. Okay, perfect. So I'm just going to start. Turn to... And just to be sure you can see the slides as well. Yeah. Okay, perfect. So uh, this is Linghua, and I'm glad to show you with the recent results for Higgs boson pair production with the full LC round two data set and high Lumi LC prospect in the Atlas experiment. The Higgs boson pair production is essentially motivated by probing the real Higgs potential and to verify the standard model. The Higgs potential in standard model looks like a Mexican hat and the electric symmetry breaking brings out the trilinear coupling of the Higgs boson and which corresponds to the Higgs pair production. And this search is mainly designed for two kinds of signal, non-resonant and resonant, depending on whether the dihex mass appears as a resonant peak. The non-resonant signal is more standard model-like, produced via as a glue gluon fusion or vector boson fusion. The main challenge is its small cross-section, for which the dihex is around 1,000 times smaller than the single hex. The most striking prospect of the non resonant signal is that it allows to measure the true linear coupling of the Higgs boson. And in addition, we are also uh, interested in the VVHH coupling that is appearing in the VBF diagram. On the other, other hand, since we know that Higgs couples directly to particles with non-zero mass, so if and um, presumably, if some massive Pearson particle exists, they could decay, possibly into two Higgs bosons. Subsequently, we are looking for such kind of new heavy particles as a spin zero or spin two. Well, um, Poser la sorry, question there is some background noise, but I don't see from who it comes. Je vais donner la parole. It's in French, actually. Is there anybody who, okay. Fine. Please continue. Okay. Okay. Fine. And um, well, um, now let's restart. Um, the configurations of dihigs decay define the various propping channels. The biggest production rate is coming from the HH24B and BB gamma gamma is the smallest one. In early round two, we have already published nice results for both non-resident and resident signal using data. Uh, with a luminosity of 36 inverse spectrogram. The more complete and more conspicuous results of four round two, benefiting from the considerable improvement and the B-tagging and our ID will be presented. Where we have updated results for 4B, for BB Lapton U, Lapton U, BB Tau Tau, and BB Gamma Gamma. Now let's start with BB Lapton U, Lapton channel. This channel searches for no resonant DGFH signals with one Higgs boson decays into two B quarks and the other decays into either double W tau tau or ZZ and then eventually decay into two leptons and two neutrinos. The H2WW mode contributes 90% of the, of the total signal. And the main background in the channel are essentially the top background Z gamma plus heavy flavor. In this channel, we require at least two B jets and two opposite sign leptons. And in presence of the neutrinos, missing transverse energy would also occur. We also select the two B mass around the Higgs mass and require small dye lepton mass in order to reduce the top background and to be away from the Z mass peak. Furthermore, 
a multi um, a multi class deep neural network is trained to extract the signal and we use its output to define our signal region and depending different configuration of lactam flavor in the final state. We also have a dedicated control regions for the background uh, normalization estimation. And the analysis result is shown in the bottom in case of standard model, the limit on cross action is set to be um, 29 times for, uh, for expected and 40 for observed with respect to the standard model prediction. We also set up limits on the kappa lambda, which is shown on the bottom, bottom right. The next channel is HH24B, purely produced from VBF. It targets the kappa 2V, namely the VVHH coupling for non resonance and the spin zero new particle for resonance. For background, uh, multi-jazz counts like, uh, around 95% of the, of the total background with TG bar as a minor contribution. And since this channel is produced only by VBF, quite often we observe two jets in the forward region. And in addition, there will be four, four B jets in the two Higgs decay. And basically, we, uh, there will be three possibilities to combine the 4B into two Higgs. And the choice is decided by optimizing the uh, form, the Higgs candidate to have similar mass as the Higgs boson. After constructing the two Higgs, the 2D uh, Higgs mass map is used to define uh, the signal region, the sideband and the validation region. In the end, the 4B invariant mass will be ta taken as uh, discrete variables and this VBF 4B channel allows us to constrain the kappa 2V within a limit interval of a width around three and centered at uh, centered near the standard model valley. On the other hand, we have also set limits uh, of spin zero new particle for different mass scenarios. For the 4B channel, apart from VBF, there's individual analysis performed for GGF production in purpose to search for resonance signal for both spin zero and spin two. And one conspicuous feature of this analysis is that it allows to count the extremely massive resonance signal, typically in order of uh, one TeV, and that will boost the Higgs and consequently the decayed 2V jets to form a large radius jets. The analysis study different um, B jet topologies uh, respectively, the result of the channel uh, contains four separate small radius B jets, and there are two large radius jets in the booster channel. The result channel um, is designed for mass below 1.5 TeV for the single hypothesis. And similar to VBF uh, 4B, we need to pair the B quarks to, into two Higgs candidates. And that is realized by a training of BDT. For the booster channel, we define the B tagging categories using the track information within the large radio jets. And signal region, control region validations, uh, regions are defined similarly uh, using the 2D Higgs mass map. And in this channel, the dominant background is multi jets and with a small contribution from TT bar. And they are eventually estimated by uh, with lower B tagging control regions using a data driven method. And this page shows the results of the GGF 4B channel that the 4B mass is used as a discrete variable. The cross section limit respectively for spin zero and spin two are shown on the right. And around MX equals to 1.1 TeV, we have observed a small excess between the expected and, and observed limits. In addition, um, for the spin two case, a specific KK graviton model has been considered and for which the mass below 298 or above uh, 1440 GeV are excluded. After having seen uh, much result from 4B, I'm going to present you another important channel, which is BB Tau Tau. This channel looks for non-random signal produced by both GGF and VBF. 
and the resonance signal under the spin zero hypothesis. Um, events containing two B jets and a two opposite side tau objects are selected. And in this analysis, we require at least one hydronically decayed tau. And due to the specific, very specific feature of tau living in the detector, it allows us to measure it uh, in a very good accuracy. And then we define three signal regions with the tau decay modes and the corresponding triggers. Furthermore, a parameterized neural network is trained for resonant, uh, for random signal and for non-resonant, a BDT and neural network is used. And in the end, the, the MVA output decided to be the final discrete variable. The main background are multi-jets and TT bar and the data, data driven method is used to uh, estimate the fake tau background. And here are the VB tau tau results. Uh, in case of a uh, standard model, we have set up limits on the HH cross section around 3.9 uh, times the standard model value for expected and 4.7 for observed. That indicates a factor four improvement as compared to the early results with a factor two comparing, I mean, coming from the increase of luminosity. We also have sensitivity um, to constrain the Higgs soft coupling um, and limit on kappa lambda are shown in the bottom left. And on, on the resonance side, the upper limit of cross section have been derived in function of a different resonance mass up to 1.6 TeV. And when with the observed data, a small excess was observed near 1 TeV, which is relevant to the enhancement in the observation in the high um, PNNS score in the data. Um, the BB data results introduced before are essentially studying the resolved, uh, resolved objects. Apart from that, we have dedicated boosted analysis, which looks at the resonance spin zero signal produ produced by GGF. And this, 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 analysis, uh, this analysis selects uh, uh, not only boosted DIB jets, but also boosted DITAL jets. And this is the first time that we use a DITAL tagger in the Atlas. Uh, in, in Atlas. If you look at the bottom left the plot, you will find that the boosted uh, algorithm remains to have uh, around 80% 80, 80 um, efficiency, even the two tau objects are close to each other. We also de developed a, a dedicated identification criteria with efficiency of 60%. And in the signal region of the visible uh, HH mass is cut depending on the signal mass hypothesis. And the cross-section limit is shown in, in the bottom. The last channel is BB Gamma Gamma. It searches for non resonance signal via both uh, GGF and the VBF production and for resonance uh, spin zero signal. It selects events with 2B jets to good quality photons and die photon in RAM mass. It requires to have to be similar as the Higgs. The main background is coming from Gamma Gamma plus jets and will be constrained by fitting the data side band. Further, MVA optimization are implemented for both the two signal and for, for non resonance case. Due to uh, because of the sensitivity of uh, different kappa lambda in different mass range, so two BDT are trained are, are, are optimized in the two range, and we will use the PDT and uh, the mass range to find four signal region. For a resonant case, a BDT is trained to extra signal. Eventually, for each signal mass, one category is defined by uh, by optimizing the BDT working point and the mass dependent MH card. And for both and, and uh, for, for, for both cases, diphoto mass is used for training. I use it for uh, for deriving the results. And this is the BB gamma gamma results. First of all, limit having set for standard model case that we we have uh, derived limits of 5.7 for expected and 4.2 for observed. And we have seen a striking improvement in year factor five as compared to the previous case. And the limit on kappa lambda are shown on the left. And we have also limit on the spin zero resonant production for uh, on the on the right, depending on different mass. After establishing results in the various channels, it's now feasible to make data combination. Let's start with the non resonant case. Uh, the left plot shows the standard model H cross section limit, and we see after combination we are able to achieve a limit at three point one. The right plot shows. The combination for kappa lambda, where we also see sensitivity from BB gamma gamma and BB tau tau in different kappa lambda range. 
In the right-hand side, the three channel, BB gamma, gamma, BB tau tau, and 4B are combined for spin zero hypothesis in a range up to 3 TV. The combination is essentially gathering the different uh, uh, advantages of each channel in different range of, uh, of the MX. So the final results, we, in the final results, you see an excess around uh, 1.1 TV, similar to the individual channel. In the future, there will be the upgraded uh, high luminosity LC with a total luminosity of 3K inverse with firm bar, as will uh, as 80% increase of the uh, HH cross-section due to the higher scientific mass energy. By making projection towards high lumi, we expect to see three sigma significance for standard model H signal after combining the three channel. As well, it will be possible to measure the kappa lambda within an uncertainty smaller than one. And just to mention, the, the, the projection was made with, uh, with the previous analysis and presumably better results are foreseen if we extrapolate the full round two result. Now I'm arriving to the conclusion. So in this presentation, the latest Atlas round two published results have been shown uh, respectively for the four decade channel and for both non-resonant and resonant signal. A few channels have been already com uh, combined and we have also dedicated study for high Lumi LTC projection. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much for this uh, very nice talk. So I see we already got our first question uh, from Jordan. Jordan, please go ahead. Good, uh, I agree, it's a nice talk. I actually have two questions. My first one's very short. You showed the combination two slides back on the different analyses. One more slide, I think. Yeah, so I'm looking at the blue line here, the 4B. Oh, sorry, the slides are being slowly. You skipped it, I think slide 14. Okay. So I was looking at the blue line here, the 4B. Am I correct to assume that only the boosted region is really contributing to the combinations here? Do you get any sensitivity with the result? Um, so uh, I think for the 4B channel in the combination, both the result of 4B uh, included. And if now we go back here, I, I think around 1.1 T, uh, TV, Actually, it's a bit tricky because we first require events to pass to resolve the selection. If it fails, we enter the boosted, uh, we will decide whether it, it will uh, be accept, accepted by the boosted uh, selection. So actually it's sort of an overlapping region between the boosted and the resolved. Am I answering the, correctly the question? Yeah, that was actually going to be my follow -up question because when you showed it on slide six, I guess I got a little bit confused on how you differentiate events between the two regions. I didn't understand if your boosting and resolve were meant to be overlapping or if they're designed to somehow be orthogonal. Oh, well, uh, yeah, 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 I understand the point. So essentially, you see there's an overlapping between the MX range for the two, for the resolved and the boosted. And as I mentioned before, uh, if event is, select, select, is, is accepted by resolve, it will not enter the boosted. So in principle, there will, will not be overlapping or double counting between the two channels. Okay. So this also means that your resolved channel is in general more sensitive than your boosted channel, is that correct? I mean, because if you give reference to the results, then it's probably that your signal over background is better there, or? Wow, well, uh, I don't think it's, uh, I don't think I have a clear answer. So uh, actually the resolve and boosted, uh, uh, the difference is just that we changed the uh, um, uh, BJAT reconstruction algorithm for the boosted, we have large reduced jets. But, but it's not I mean, it's, it's not really clear to say that around one TV that the boosted is uh, better in all the case than the resolved. Uh, mm -hmm. I think if you go to like two, T, two TV, it's quite clear the boosted is better. But I think this is the reason we remains a bit uh, 
let's say ambiguous, uh, ambiguous that actually part of events is a uh, dropping in resolved and part of events is a dropping in boosted. Yeah, okay, thanks a lot. Uh, yeah, so I think we have to go to the second talk uh, of DevData. So um, yeah, if you can stop sharing, then we can, uh, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, hello, uh, can you hear me? We can hear you very clearly, yes. All right, uh, I should be sharing my screen now, right? Um, yes. Yeah. Now can you see it? I'm flipping through. I guess you can see my pointer as well. Yeah, now we see everything. Uh, yeah, you still see it, right? I'm in full screen mode, so I will get started. Okay, uh, well, I'll talk about uh, CMS results with uh, run to data on extended hex sectors and the BSM DKs of the hex boson. So new resonances, which are hex-like, as well as newer DK modes of the, the hex boson, uh, some of them uh, not in the support in the standard model. So just a quick snapshot of all the results that I will be talking of today. So as I said, uh, it's run to data with uh, luminosity, well, more or less the full luminosity for most of the channels. Um, uh, for the BSM and rare DKs, I have uh, hex going to invisible or Lepton flavor by violating DKs or hex going to lighter resonances, as well as hex going to uh, quarconia, such so also in quarconia or uh, to quarconia curves. Um, and for the extended hex sectors, uh, there could be lighter scalars, lighter than the 125 GB hex boson, as well as uh, heavier scalars. And there are different DK modes that uh, we have, uh, well, sorry, uh, different uh, production, as well as DK modes of these uh, that we've uh, looked at. And there's many results on the, the chart hex bosons as well. So uh, there are quite a few results I'll get uh, going quickly. And I'll, well, if you have some questions, I'll try to answer later on on the details. So I'll start with this uh, search for a new resonance uh, uh, X, uh, generically named, uh, which decays to, uh, to lighter uh, particles, which are again called A. And both these A's decay into a pair of uh, uh, B quarks. Uh, these are the mass ranges, so the A, the A particle is much lighter than the, the, the X, and uh, the A is, in particular, pretty high boost. The way these are reconstructed is using large area jets. In CMS, we use uh, uh, AK, anti-KT jets with a radius of 0.8. Uh, so these are the AK-8 jets. And, uh, of course, there are some kinematic cuts on these. And uh, for flavor tagging, we, uh, this analysis is using the, the deep double B uh, multivariate tagger which looks at the double B content of these jets. Now, the, for this analysis with the kinematic selections that they have in the mass range, that this being, they're looking at uh, most of the backgrounds are from multi-jet production uh, with a bit from TT bar. So the multi-jet production is, uh, is, you know, like it's always difficult to estimate from uh, simulations. So it's a stamp, uh, estimated from site balance uh, using an ABCD like method. Um, the variables that are used are the deep double B tagger. Uh, you invert the discriminator to get a um, uh, QCD in which region, and uh, delta eta. So uh, delta eta narrow means that you are in the single region, and uh, large delta eta would be the, the sideband regions. So these are the spectra of uh, the average jet mass. Uh, so there are two variables involved here. One is the average mass of the two jets because they're like two, uh, and it's symmetric. So both the A's go to BB bar. And the digit mass, which uh, when you put uh, the two jets, uh, so that mass should correspond to the, the mass of this particle X. And uh, the estimated backgrounds are shown, and a few signal mass points are shown as well uh, to the fitted data. And here, uh, what I'm showing you here, the integration of the results, uh, there are the limits on the uh, here on the right as a function of the, the X mass. And uh, for different uh, assumed masses for A, and there's some theoretical interpretations. I'll get to it in a minute. There was also one a bit where there was an excess, uh, just a bit above uh, three sigma. So that's what's uh, shown here on the, the left as a B value as a function of the AMOS. For the limits, uh, these are interpreted using a model where uh, the cross section of X. So the X, uh, as you, if I go back, uh, it's a pretty standard production. But uh, of course, uh, what happens in the loop is subject to the new physics interpretation uh, or the model that they're looking at. And uh, uh, counting number of fermions, the cross section changes, and uh, that's what's uh, uh, used in the interpretation here. 
Okay, I will go to the next uh, analysis, which is similar, but in this case, uh, the X does not go to two unknown particles, but the one is the 125 GeV Higgs boson and the other to an unknown particle, which could have a wide range of mass. Uh, the techniques are similar, except that uh, the mass ranges probed are slightly different. Uh, kinematic selections are different. And instead of using the double deep double B tagger, uh, there's a new uh, tagger based on graph neural network called the particle net, which is used for identifying these uh, boosted jets uh, with a, a BB bar pair. And then again, uh, it's more or less a, a very similar. So you reconstruct the X using the, these jets, and you are probing for uh, in the uh, in, in the two dimensional plane of the mass of the, the of X and the mass of this unknown particle, which now is uh, labeled Y. And uh, I'm showing you the one dimensional projection as a function of the jet, which is used to reconstruct the mass of the Y. Uh, here, uh, there's a bit more TT bar, and the mass just comes from, again, the, the side bands using a, a bit of an extended ABCD-like method, and the TT bar backgrounds come from simulations, but now there is also some data-driven corrections using uh, leptonic uh, uh, channels. And again, for the interpretation, uh, well, everything agrees with the, the, the backgrounds uh, and the data agrees. So uh, the limits are placed here uh, as a function of the masses of these two unknown resonances, the X and the Y. Um, uh, these channels are interesting in many different models, but for the moment, uh, for the preliminary results, we are looking at uh, uh, interpretation based on the NMSSN projections. And uh, here with this, we managed to exclude a little bit of the parameter space of NMSSM that is shown here with this red hatched area. And uh, sometimes it's easier to look at one dimensional uh, exclusion limits, uh, which is shown on the, uh, the right as a function of the heavier resonance mass X uh, for different assumed values of the, the lighter resonance Y. Uh, just for completeness of quickly, Flash this result, which has been published now, but this is in a different final state. Uh, the same physics, different final state, BB tau tau uh, now, where the standard model hex goes and goes to tau tau, and this unknown resonance goes to BB. They look for uh, uh, a slightly, uh, they will go down to a much lower range of mass for the, the heavier Higgs boson, and also a much higher range of mass for the, the, the unknown uh, uh, particle here. But the interpretation is again an MSSM. Uh, and uh, as you can see, that there's a bit of exclusion at a lower mass here um, for this uh, channel. Going on to uh, uh, now uh, different uh, mode of production and decay. So these are light exposons uh, uh, in the SUSY cascades decays. Um, here, uh, the squarks or the gluinos, they decay to, uh, uh, well, uh, uh, through cascades, and eventually uh, we have these light exposons, which are. Um, Label is AH1. So there are other unknown masses, of course, uh, the LSP, the NLSP. Um, the, the way this analysis is set up is it, it's uh, uh, looking at uh, a very, very low MET. So most of the uh, energy is visible, and these are all reconstructed as jets in the, the final state. And again, uh, this analysis also looks at um, uh, mass ratios so that the H1 is uh, highly boosted and is reconstructed again using uh, very similar techniques as the previous two analyses, as well as uh, using a double B tagging here. So of course, uh, we want to probe different uh, values of the H1 masses. And uh, well, again, uh, for estimation of the background, which is uh, mostly QCD dominated, um, the, the mass space is uh, partitioned as follows. So it's, uh, a bit, it looks a bit complicated. Uh, the difference that uh, the blues uh, S uh, labeled S's are the different uh, signal regions corresponding to different masses of the H1. And you have the sidebands in red from which you estimate uh, a transfer factor uh, for QCD fake rate, which is then um, well, uh, multiplied by uh, a similar yield in a control region, uh, which is uh, shown here on the right hand side. Um, and that's how you get the uh, background, esti uh, the estimated QCD background in the signal regions. Um, uh, this has uh, analysis of several search re regions, uh, which is shown here as uh, different bins um, on the, in the left plot. Uh, uh, most of this, uh, uh, as you can see, that there's a good agreement between the estimated backgrounds and the data here. Um, and uh, one proceeds to set uh, limits here on the, the masses of the, the SUSI particles. 
So MSUSI here is the mark of the skill mountain, the masses of the quarks and the glinos. Um, they're mostly degenerate. Uh, the glino mass, if I remember, it's uh, just slightly, uh, it's one person larger than the quark mass, but it's MSUSI is the, is the scale for that. And there is uh, the MH1 uh, on the y axis. So, um, okay, uh, I'm going on to uh, slide 10 here. Uh, uh, this is uh, the Higgs boson uh, in, uh, in invisible TK. So that's a uh, rare process in the standard model, but there are different uh, new physics scenarios with uh, Higgs portals, which uh, uh, will favor a larger round branch of fraction for this. Um, there are two analysis uh, categories uh, to enhance the sensitivity of this uh, production. Uh, which is based on the missing transverse momentum and the properties of the, the, the jets. So these jets are supposed to be forward because we're looking at uh, VPF production here. And the dominant in the irreducible backgrounds are uh, is that going to neutrinos and jets. And in this case, uh, the, the estimate of the signal in the backgrounds uh, are fit to data using this variable MJJ, which is the invariant mass of these two uh, forward looking uh, forward uh, jets here. And backgrounds are modeled uh, using uh, different control regions for estimating the different components uh, of the, the uh, drillian and the compass jets background here. Um, so, yeah, okay. Uh, this shows you the, the results. Um, uh, on the left, you see the, the limits on the, the branching fraction of uh, the, the Higgs going to invisible. Uh, now, the, uh, what's shown here are the results for three different years and then the combined uh, result for the whole of one, two. Uh, it's also interesting that this under certain conditions uh, can be interpreted as a um, uh, um, uh, interaction of the dark matter candidate uh, with the nucleon. And that's what is shown here on the right hand side um, as a function of the dark matter candidate. And for comparison, there are other experiments. Uh, and will be uh, uh, fixed target uh, dedicated dark matter experiments, which have a bit more sensitive to higher masses. And you can see the CMS results um, in uh, uh, red and orange, uh, which actually gives a good sensitivity for lower masses of the dark matter candidate. So this is again uh, back to uh, um, a new uh, kind of resonance uh, from the DK of a Higgs boson. Um, uh, here, uh, the two, both these resonances decays to a pair of photons. Um, so you have a four gamma final state in which you uh, pair up and the infinite mass should correspond to the, the Higgs boson itself. So um, uh, here, uh, and the, the analysis uh, uses a, a specific uh, reconstruction of the primary vertex, not the standard one, which is using CMS by most of the other analysis, which improves the, the four gamma uh, invariant mass resolution by about uh, 3%. The signal model is a parametric um, using uh, a Gaussian and uh, crystal ball functions, um, uh, which also has the advantage that you do not simulate all the signal mass points, but you can interpolate between these. Now, the, the background is, uh, after all, the selection criteria is like quite small. So, uh, for the uh, for modeling the background, one uses this technique of mixing data events. So, what is done is a series of data events is taken, and uh, the photon of one is replaced by the kinematics of the photon and one of the events replaced by uh, 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 the photon from the, the next or the adjacent event. And using this, one can generate a larger statistics for the background, uh, which is then uh, modeled using uh, a, a set of uh, parametric functions. And uh, uh, you can see the, the uh, results uh, here. So before that also, I want to say like, okay, there's a BGT classifier for separating all the signal and the background. You can see this on the left plot. The, the spectra of the four, uh, photon in weight mass is in the middle. And this sets a limit on the uh, mass of the, uh, the, the, the production uh, process here as a function of the, the mass of A. Um, uh, left hand favor violating TKs. Uh, this is again uh, uh, not uh, allowed in the standard model, but you have uh, several models, uh, BSMs, uh, which uh, support this. And uh, CMS has a, had a look at this plus, uh, uh, but this is a result that has already been published. Um, there are several channels which are explored. And uh, what is done is the result looks at the Yuka coupling of the the uh, the e, e tau and the me tau. So there are two here, one who corresponds to the left-handed and one corresponds to the right-handed. And you can see the expected in the of limit. 
For the left, the experimental positions are almost identical, so you can't distinguish them. For the right, it's slightly different. And there are some other uh, extrusion ranges coming from the other DKs that have not been seen. Um, okay, I think I should move on quickly now. How much time do I have? I have five minutes? No, no, no two minutes. Uh, two minutes, oh, sorry. Okay, so uh, this is the VPF production of charged and doubly charged Higgs bosons. Uh, this is interesting for probing the, the George and uh, models where you have these SAG doublets uh, and triplets kilos. And uh, in these models, these charging bosons only get very uh, coupled to the, the W the Z bosons. Uh, therefore, the VVF production mode is an interesting one here. So uh, again, uh, this is uh, uh, looking at the final states with leptons. And uh, then of course you have the VPF uh, like signatures and searches performed in the of these invariant mass of the forward jets as well as the transverse mass of the VV. So because you have neutrinos from WD case, it's not the full mass, but you have transverse mass here. And then you have exclusion limits on the, the, the charged Higgs bosons on the double charged Higgs bosons. But in these models, they're generally called H5, and uh, that's what's shown here. And you can also set a limit on this plane of MH5 with this coupling SH parameter, which basically uh, determines the, the fraction of the mass of the double boson that comes from the webs of one of these uh, uh, scalar fields. Um, for the, this is uh, the last, the newest results that we have. This is the DK of the Higgs boson to uh, Z and the porconium or two porconia. Now, uh, this is in, uh, the, again, like uh, four lepton final states, electrons and muons. And there's a, uh, uh, what is done here is that, of course, uh, you reconstruct the set using either two electrons or two muons. And then the quaconium, um, uh, well, uh, eventually it gets to J psi, and the J psi goes to, uh, is reconstructed using dynions. And uh, a parameter fit of the signal in the background is done to extract the signal strength. And then uh, limits are set on the different branching fractions uh, of Higgs going to previous quaconia here. Um, of course, a lot of data is needed to really probe these thoroughly, but there's some interesting uh, results already here. So, and that brings me to the outlook. So we have like, uh, what I'm showing you is like uh, the uh, rare DKs of the 125 TV Higgs boson, as well as searches for new scalars and zero scalars in uh, several DSM models. And uh, while all these searches show that, uh, well, uh, the results are consistent with the standard model on your predictions, uh, there is also a lot of uh, constraints on many of these new models, which is actually quite interesting. So we are ending up run two on a strong note, and for run three, of course, the, like huge number of like improvements uh, lined up, uh, enhanced detectors, near triggers, uh, algorithms for all the odds, object detections, etc. So stay tuned, and uh, we hope to have like lots of exciting new physics. Thank you. Thanks a lot for uh, this very interesting and nice talk. Um, so I see already a question from Tanya. Tanya, please go ahead. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, Tanya. <clears throat> very good, thank you. So thanks for the talk. Uh, can you go to slide six? I will ask you something you for sure know. Uh, for sure, for sure. Slide six, uh, yes. Yes, exactly. So I mean, yesterday we heard in one of the talks that uh, for the BB bar, BB bar final state, for the standard Dihigs <clears throat> search, yeah. So where the Y is also an H, so to say, mm -hmm. you are better in the search than um, a previous a previous uh, um, uh, yes, search. yes, yeah, exactly. So uh, I ask you the same question as I asked yesterday. I mean, will this then be incorporated in the in the combination uh, in the well, we are in the talks. Um, well, mm -hmm. uh, a priori, probably it makes sense to use this result in the combination. And you see that we are covering 125 GB. That's the basic basis yeah, yeah. of your statement, right? So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, but this is uh, still under discussion. So, there are a few mm -hmm. other things, including signal models that we need to generate and things. And uh, whether we really are doing better for every mass, uh, uh, the whole mass range that we're looking at. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, because I mean, also, as I stated yesterday, this. These kind of channels are now investigated broadly, so I think it always makes sense to not see it as a separate search, but for this no, MY. It's, it could... it's a continuation of the same search, so the reason yeah. that it improved was because we're using the particle net tag, which is mm. new, mm. and it gives large improvement, and of course it makes sense to go with the, the latest and the best result. 
Okay, very good. Okay, so I encourage you to share. Thanks. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, Nikos also has a question. Please. Yeah, hi, uh, uh, hi, Devdata. Uh, I actually have a question about um, uh, your uh, slide 12 for the um, um, for gamma uh, analysis. And mm -hmm. I, I was wondering what, what kind of uh, trigger you use there? Is the trigger uh, limitation? Um, it's the standard die photon trigger. The trigger limitations are, um, oh, I mean, there's the standard limitation of how low in PT you can go. Um, I think there are two photons with one with PT 18 GeV, one with PT 30 GeV. And uh, there's some photon shower shape variables uh, involved in the, the trigger part. Mm -hmm. if I remember okay, so yeah. stand, standard things. Okay, mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. thank you very much. Sure. Okay, so I suggest that we close the talk here. Thanks a lot again. And so we'll go to the next speaker, which is Mohammed, which will talk about light charge Higgs boson searches. So, um, uh, hello, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yes, just let me share my screen. Okay. I think you can see my screen, right? Yeah, we can see it. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Thank you very much for accepting me to give a talk here. So uh, here I'm going to talk about some new channels or some new discovery modes here for a light charged Higgs at the Large Hadron Collider within the two Higgs tablet model. Uh, this talk is based on these two published papers, which are in, collabora in, in collaboration with my professors here. So let's first discuss a little bit the TWIX tablet model. So the TWIX tablet model is the simplest extension contain containing the charged Higgs boson, as it adds another tablet of Higgs with same quantum number. Here in equation number two, I, uh, I'm showing the most general normalizable potential which uh, uh, parameterize these two Higgs of tab two Higgs tablets. So, for example, here if we uh, if we enforce as it do symmetry, some of the parameters here disappear. For example, lambda six, lambda seven, and one to square disappear. But since here we focus on the CP conserving to each dm with a softly symmetry breaking, we keep these parameters in one to square. So, uh, as we know in the standard model, so after Electroweak symmetry breaking, we have here four physical Higgs. We end up, of course, with seven free parameters, four physical Higgs masses, uh, the mass of the little each capital each uh, pseudo scalar E and charged Higgs, to alpha, which is the mixing angle between the two CP even Higgs states, tangent to beta, which is the, the ratio of the two waves, and of course, the parameters in one to square. In fact, if both of the doublets uh, interact with with uh, with uh, all fermions, this can introduce uh, some flavor changing neutron current scenarios. Uh, in order to to avoid this dangerous scenario, which would be inconsistent with experiment, we well, we impose here the Z to symmetry. Then we have four four possible types of the PHDM. So type one, type two. Type X called also lipton specific type and type Y called also flipped type. So here we target type one and type X since uh, a light charged Higgs is still agree with uh, experimental data, especially from flavor uh, physics. The in fact the coupling of the of the charged and neutral Higgs to quarks and leptons is described by the Yukawa Lacrangian which the kappas here are the coupling, are the Yukawa coupling, which are listed here in this table. So here we target type one and type X. The, the only difference here between these two types being in the leptonic sector, as you can see in this table. So here in our parameter space, we scan over all the all the parameter space we perform a, a broad general scan, assuming that the capital H is the observed one at the at the LHC in 2012, fixed to one to five GV. 
here we then little each would be smaller in comparison with the, with the capital each so we require that each point each point here uh, satisfy theory, both theoretical and experimental constraints so from theoretical side uh, we check here unitarity perturbativity and, and vacuum stability as well as the oblique uh, the electroweak oblique parameters st and u uh, using the public code to hdmc in addition here the uh, some bounds from additional higgs are enforced using the public code here higgs bound and the uh, agreement with the with the higgs signal measurement are enforced using here the public the public code here higgs signal Constraints from flavor uh, from B physics observable are checked using the public code here super ISO. So as you can say, as you can, as as I'm showing here in this plot, a light charged Higgs is still allowed by flavor constraint. Same case for the Higgs tablet model type X. So in fact, uh, almost all experimental searches for for charged Higgs target the fermionic decay channels. Of the of this particle, so here we target or we focus on the bosonic decay. Since uh, I mean here the charged Higgs decays into W and a new standard model Higgs. Okay, since this uh, this bo this bosonic decay has a naturally large branching ratio, especially when we are close to the alignment limit, and also for small neutral Higgs, as I'm showing here in these plots. For both uh, decay of the charge x to w little h or a, this branching ratio can reach 100% and can dominate over the fermionic decay channels. In fact, at Hadron Collider, one can produce at light charged Higgs uh, via typically via top decay. Uh, I mean here the tete bar production followed by top decay into charged Higgs and B. And this is exactly what experimentalists use to look for this particle. So here we, we target the same scenario, but here we, 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 we require that the charge X decays bosonically. And then we expect to have 2W plus 4 standard model final state. So this, uh, this scenario is, is computed uh, at, in, at the top on shell approximation or in the, in the narrow width approximation. While for example, if the mass of the charged Higgs close to the top one, this approximation becomes invalid. And it is quite appropriate to, to target this scenario, I mean the associated production of the T and the P to look for this charged Higgs. So we're assuming that charged Higgs produced via this channel and uh, uh, following by the bosonic decay, we expect to have the same final state here. So our idea here is to compare these two scenarios. One can also produce charged Higgs via uh, by Higgs processes or electroweak processes. So for example, per charged Higgs production, the direct production of charged Higgs via its pair. So here, for example, produce two pair, two charged Higgs and then, and we, and we require that this particle decays bosonically. So this state, this scenario can give us also the same final state as the first one. The most important one is the associated production with another neutral Higgs. So, so which, which uh, this scenario will give us W plus four gamma final state. So our idea here is to, is to revise all this scenario, these two scenarios used by experimentalists and compare them with electroweak production channels. So here in this plot, um, uh, we compare different final state from different scenarios. So for example, here W plus four B final state from associated production. So Higgs decays bosonically to W and little each and little each decays to PP bar. So we have W plus four B. We compare this signature with with this with two W plus four B from uh, from processes involving Tom quarks. So here from the TT bar production and the followed by top decay and here the associated production with T and P followed by top decay, etc. So as you can see here, there are many points here which are quite important than than the uh, than the than this scenario i mean scenario in uh, processes involving top quarks 
So here, the red points here refers to the percharged Higgs production. I mean, signatures from percharged Higgs production. So it is clear that signatures from by Higgs production, I mean, associated production and percharged Higgs production are quite interesting and important uh, with respect to the signatures from uh, processes involving top quark. So here, each to BB bar, branch ratio X to BB bar can reach values above 80%. So this conclusion is extended to the final state to be to tau. So the same conclusion, the same results are also validated in the final state to be to tau. One additional thing here is that the, the, the black point here refers to the four tau final state in the two X doublet model type X. This scenario is quite important since of the Yukawa coupling because little each, the decay of little each to tau tau is proportional to tangent beta. And if, if tangent beta is large, then this scenario would be important. So yes, here uh, the Higgs to tau tau in type X can reach 100%, okay? So here to motivate, uh, to motivate experimentalists for this scenario, for this new scenarios as alternative, as alternative ones, uh, with respect to the scenarios from, uh, uh, to the signatures from processes involving top quarks. So we propose here some benchmark points for both type one and type X. So this benchmark point, for example, for each benchmark point, we compute the total cross section. I mean here the, the 4B final state. Here are the numbers of the, of the 4B final state from processes involving top quarks are small here from the per charged Higgs production. And the most important ones are from uh, associated production uh, with little h or a. The same situation for the TX doublet model type X, the only relevant scenario is the associated production, uh, which, which, we, uh, which its signature is W plus four tau final state. So we select also the case where the mass of the charged Higgs is, is uh, greater than MT. Uh, notice that here we, we also take into account the mixing state, I mean, uh, the off diagonal element. So if, for example, charged Higgs produced it in additional with little each, uh, in association with little each, then, uh, then charged Higgs can decay into W little A, uh, or W little each or etc. So we have four four uh, four possibilities here. Uh, so here we have the total production rates of different final states from different scenario, from different scenarios. Okay. So here, for example, four B final states from from processes involving top quarks are quite small compared to the same final states from per charge X production. And the most important one is the associated production, which is quite large compared to, to, to these two scenarios. The same situation is also uh, important for the two beta tau final state. So always this scenario is the, uh, the important one. For the, two, for the two X doublet model type X, also here the W plus four tau from associated production is the dominant one for our benchmark points, of course. So final state, from the Higgs processes are quite large compared to those from processes involving top quarks. Signatures from uh, associated productions are always dominant one in both, in both two, uh, two types of interest here. Another, imp another important scenario is that when, when little each becomes fermiophobic. So if, the, if cosine is beta vanis, this cosine beta is the capital little ions, then, the, the decay of the H to gamma gamma can be large, of course, dominated by the charged Higgs loop. So also the Higgs decays into fermions or to gluons are suppressed by these parameters. So here the Higgs to gamma gamma is the dominant one since here the Higgs to, to for example, WW is suppressed by sinus beta minus alpha and kinematics. Since here we target, we are near the aligned limit. So the, the most important one here is the Higgs gamma gamma as I'm showing here. So here I'm showing here the branch relative to Higgs to gamma gamma as a function of the coupling of the little H to fermions. 
And as you can see here can reach values uh, 80%. So here before the WW threshold or, or before the opening of the Higgs to WW, the Higgs to gamma gamma can be the dominant one. Of course, uh, when this coupling to when the coupling uh, to little h to fermions is uh, close to zero. Okay, so naturally the branching ratio of the of, of the charged Higgs, I mean here decay into W and little h uh, can reach 100%. Since this scenario is proportional to the uh, coupling of the charged Higgs W and little h, which is cosinus beta minus alpha, which is quite important in our case here. So focusing on these scenarios, it is it would be promising to investigate multi-photon final stage from the from the from the associated production with little of charged Higgs with little h. I mean this scenario. Okay. So here I'm showing the production of the charged Higgs with little h. This 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 production cross sections uh, enjoy uh, two sorts of enhancement. One is the coupling of the charged Higgs little h and w, which is proportional to cosinus beta minus alpha. And other one is the is the fast space afforded due to the light, to the light uh, each and the light charged Higgs. So here I'm showing the final state. I'm showing the total final state. I mean here the total cross section of W plus four gamma. As you can see here, this cross sections, total cross sections can reach 200%, 200 fim to one. Okay. So from this plot, we, we chose or we select 14 benchmark points, which have large, large uh, total cross section. We require that these benchmark points uh, have, have a W of shell or on shell, depending on the splitting mass between the charged Higgs and little each. The most important results of this scenario is that when we estimate the already stable standard model W plus for gamma background, we found the signal cross sections is less than 10 minus six picobar. So here the, the background associated to this scenario is almost no existent. So after taking into account uh, parton shower hadronization and detector effect, we confirmed the parton level study and we, we found that in presence of both background generated by real or fake photons from jets, this signal is essentially background free. Uh, okay, so uh, to conclude, here a charged Higgs boson is always predicted in the multi-Higgs tablet model. So when this particle is light, production channels or electroweak production are quite important than production from processes involving top quarks followed of course by the bosonic decay, which is, dominate, which is naturally dominate over the fermionic decay. So these two scenarios could will be the most promising discovery channels for discovery channels for, uh, for charged Higgs boson. So we suggested here for B to B to tau and for tau final states as potential discovery channels. However, in the, in the so-called fermiophobic limit, four gamma signatures can give the best reach here since it is essentially background free. This, this signature can lead to, to a large significance which only depend on the signal cross sections and collider integrated luminosity. So in order to motivate experimentalists to look for this scenario, for this alternative scenarios, we proposed uh, some benchmark point for both type one and type X uh, to search for, this, uh, for these particles. Uh, that's all, thank you. Thanks a lot for this very interesting talk. Um, are there any questions uh, at this moment? Yes, I see one. Uh, from Tanya. Tanya, please go ahead. Yeah, uh, thanks. So it's a question to the speaker, but also to the experimentalists in the audience. Uh, I don't know everyone, but I know that there are some experimentalists. I mean, <clears throat> it's it's very nice, but of course now the question is, you know, how realistic is it to 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 do this study? So to to Mohammed, maybe did you discuss this already with experimental? people who are interested and to the experimentalists in the audience, I mean, do you see this as something which 
can and will be done soon or are there any any uh, impediments so to say for yes uh, of course here for example for this important uh, results which we which here this signature have uh, almost have almost have almost the background here is is free so mm. we we perform a monte carlo analysis uh, taking into account uh, uh, part on shower detector level and uh, okay, and detector effect of course and and we provide some expected significance to motivate experiment list to to search or to look to this in, uh, to, to this very important signatures for the other channels, I mean here the 4B or for tau final state, we, we are now analyze this this final state uh, to present some some uh, some sophisticated analysis of this final state. Yeah. I mean, in, order like motivate, in yeah. order to motivate, of course, experiment list. And another one is that we provide or we select some benchmark points for both these two scenarios. Uh, of course, to motivate this uh, yeah. uh, this uh, signature. Okay. I mean, my question was more, uh, you know, how far are you in your motivation? <laughs> so uh, there's always a step, you know, which has to be taken to to take this really into a, a also manpower intensive uh, experimental study. So I, I don't know, maybe Jeff Data has an answer. I see his hand is up. So, okay. Yes. Thank you. Hey, um, I know not much of an answer, maybe just thinking aloud. I know, I mean, I'm from CMS. Uh, uh, others can chime in, especially if there's like a atlas. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, starting well, we're kind of at the threshold of run three, so uh, yeah, it's interesting and um, probably there's some trigger limitations for some of these. Uh, so uh, if we want to do that, and I, I'm I certainly agree that we should do that. Probably the first thing is to do some uh, trigger feasibility studies. I don't know if you're in touch with any of the experimentalists. Um, that would be probably one of the the first things to see. Um, Okay, thanks. I see one comment here from Jordan also saying that the major hurdle uh, he sees is primarily on the background estimation. So it's tricky to control the systematics. Yeah, okay. I mean, as usual, you know, there are so many fantastic phenol studies mm -hmm. out there. So I'm always wondering. What is the thing which stops these phenol studies from being taken over by the experiment? So I think this is something one should emphasize more somehow or yeah. make clear. Yeah. Okay, thanks a lot uh, for the talk and also the discussion. And now we'll switch to supersymmetry actually with John, who's giving a talk on uh, supersymmetry and hadronic final states with the CMS experiment. So, Mohammed, if you can stop sharing. Oh, okay. Th thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. okay. Uh, just a moment. Let me pull up my slides. Get my screen share going. Okay. Okay. We can hear and see you. Okay. All right. Uh, so, yes, yeah, so I'll, I'll uh, talk about our recent searches for supersymmetry in hadronic final states uh, at CMS. Uh, so, of course, as you know, uh, supersymmetry, there are a lot of different supersymmetric models, and every one of those models can produce many different final states. Uh, today, I'm focusing particularly on low mass stop squarks, uh, charginos and neutralinos, because these are both uh, theoretically well motivated and also experimentally accessible. Uh, now, these Particular particles are going to decay, of course, uh, generally via some kind of a cascade, and their decays will very often produce top quarks, W bosons, Z bosons, Higgs bosons. Uh, and all of these particles, all of these standard model particles, eventually have a pretty large branching ratio to hadrons. Um, and so the result of that is that these hadronic final state searches tend to have pretty good statistics. Uh, on the other hand, the backgrounds tend to be somewhat challenging, but this is something that we can deal with in a variety of different ways, as uh, I'll show uh, through the, the rest of the talk. Uh, now, this is, of course, complementary to leptonic final states, where you have one or more charged leptons. Uh, these have much more uh, controllable and small backgrounds, uh, but the trade-off is that the, the rates are much lower. Uh, 
Uh, so in particular today, there are three searches that I'm going to present. Uh, one is a search for stop squarks. Uh, one is a search for charginos or neutralinos. And then the third is a search for higginos. So first, the uh, stop squarks. Um, so of course, as with anything in SUSE, there are a lot of different models of stop production. Uh, this one in particular assumes our parity conservation. And so the LSP, the lightest supersymmetric particle, will be stable. And the stop score will decay to an LSP plus some number of standard model particles. Uh, and then the LSP is going to be invisible in our detector, so we will see this as missing transverse momentum. Now, the exact set of standard model particles that you get is going to be largely determined by the mass splitting uh, between the stop squark and the LSP. Uh, so if you're looking at the, the plot on the lower left, there are several different regions based on this mass splitting. The farthest right in green uh, is the case where the mass splitting is larger than the mass of the top. So that means there's enough energy in the stop decay to produce a top quark and an LSP, and that's what you're going to get almost all of the time. Then as you move down in your mass splitting, eventually you don't have enough energy to produce a top, but you still have enough to produce a W and a B. And so via an off-shell top, this is what you're going to wind up with. But then if you go further down and you don't even have enough energy for WB, then you've entered what we call the compressed region. And there are many final states possible here dependent on uh, some finer details of exactly what your model looks like. Then there's one more region uh, outlined in blue that I particularly want to point out, which is what we call the top corridor. And this is where the mass splitting delta M is very close to the top mass. And this is difficult because in this region, the uh, signal, your supersymmetric signal, looks very similar to standard model top production. But regardless, assuming that all of the things you're producing decay to hadrons, uh, then you're going to get some missing PT and a bunch of jets. So to carry out this search, we require, uh, we, we select a data set that requires zero charged leptons, a bunch of jets, and some missing PT. Uh, of course, we want to cover all ranges of delta M, uh, with the exception uh, of the top corridor. And so that means we have to deal with final states that look like uh, all of the diagrams on the right there. And if you notice a lot, not all necessarily, but a lot of these diagrams have final states that include multiple on-shell top quarks or on-shell W bosons or B jets. And so one of the ways that we extract the signal from the otherwise large QCD background, is that we develop uh, some taggers to try to identify top quarks and W bosons and, and B quarks. Uh, and in fact, we have two different top taggers, uh, a resolved top tagger for the case where the, the PT of the top is relatively low. And so we can see its decay products as three individual jets. But then as you run the top PT up, its decay products become collimated into a single large jet. And the efficiency of that resolved tagger drops off as you can see in the, the lower left plot, and the merged tagger, which looks for just a single large jet and tries to identify a top quark there, picks up. So by using both of these taggers, we can cover a, a very wide range of top PT. Uh, we also have the W tagger, which serves to tag Ws, but also to cover sort of the intermediate case where sometimes uh, the top is boosted enough that the W products are in one jet, but the B is separate. And then similarly for uh, B tagging, uh, we do have, uh, again, a combination of a, a low PTB tagger and a high PTB tagger. Okay, so I mentioned the backgrounds. Uh, we do have some pretty significant backgrounds. The most important in this case actually turns out to be what we call the lost lepton background. So if you're producing standard model processes like uh, TT bar and W plus jets, then you can get real missing PT along with a charged lepton. So that shouldn't wind up in our data set unless we lose the lepton. Uh, that is, if it, it goes into a crack in the detector or is otherwise not reconstructed for some reason, then it winds up in our, our detector. Uh, we also have significant backgrounds from uh, Z plus jets, where the Z goes to neutrinos, and just QCD multi-jet production. Uh, we estimate these backgrounds with a data-driven method using control regions and Monte Carlo to extrapolate from the control regions to the search region. And then we take our search region and we split it up into a large number of search bins uh, based on a variety of different variables using the taggers and, and other things. Uh, and we have carefully designed these search bins to give us sensitivity to various different models. Uh, so the search bins in the upper plot here 
are particularly designed to be sensitive to the low delta M models. And the ones in the lower plot here are particularly designed to be sensitive to the high delta M models. Uh, and then there are two more plots of, of more high delta M bins. Uh, and looking at these plots or the others in the paper, uh, there's no excess in our data above the standard model background prediction. So uh, we proceed to set limits. Uh, the limit plot here is just one model. Uh, and you might notice there's a little whited out area in the corner. That is the top corridor. We're, we're not trying to set limits in the top corridor with this analysis. Uh, but then the, the x-axis is the stop quark mass, and the y-axis is the LSP mass. Uh, the color is the actual cross-section limit, and then the, uh, the lines show where either we expect or where we, in fact, observe our cross-section limit to in intersect the theoretical calculated cross-section. And so if you're below and to the left of the black line, then those are stop and LSP masses that are excluded. Now, if you assume a massless LSP, then we exclude stop masses all the way up to about 1.3 TeV, which represents a significant improvement of about 200 GeV uh, over previous CMS analyses in the same final state. Uh, some of this comes from the additional data of using all of run two. Uh, a lot of it comes from the use of the top and W taggers and careful reoptimization of the search bins. Okay, so we've got these nice limits on uh, squark production, and maybe it starts to look like Perhaps the squarks are too massive to see at the LHC, but even in that case, if we have supersymmetry, we still have some reason to expect that charginos and or neutralinos may appear at around 1 TeV. So we also have this search for either chargino neutralino production, as in the upper diagram, or chargino pair production, as in the lower diagram. Uh, we are doing this analysis under the assumption, again, that our parity is conserved that the LSP is the lightest neutralino and that that lightest neutralino is Beano-like. Uh, we assume that the lightest chargino is the next to lightest supersymmetric particle and that it is Wino-like. And for the case where we're looking for the chargino neutralino production, where we're producing the second lightest neutralino, we assume that that particle is mass degenerate with the lightest chargino, so they are both in LSPs, and that it is also Wino-like. So we wind up with uh, a pair of heavy bosons from the decays of these Wino-like particles, uh, maybe WW, WZ, or WH, plus two LSPs. Now the W and the Z and the Higgs all like to go to quarks, and so uh, we do this in the uh, all-hydronic final state, where again we have lots of jets and missing PT. Uh, so we do this search by requiring uh, our events in our data set to have a lot of missing PT. Uh, and we're doing this specifically in the part of phase space where the bosons are boosted. And so their decay products uh, should be captured in each one in a single large radius or AK8 jet. And then we also uh, require there to be somewhere between two and six sort of normal or AK4 jets. And those AK4 jets may overlap with the AK8 jets. We, we don't require them to be exclusive. Uh, and then I mentioned, uh, so we, we, uh, we develop taggers to try to identify the decays of the heavy bosons in the AK8 jets. Uh, there are actually three of them that we're using in this analysis. There's a W tagger that specifically tries to target W decays, a V tagger uh, that is very similar to the W tagger, uh, but doesn't care as much about the mass. And so that allows us to target either Z or W decays. And you can see that in, uh, the upper figure where we have the jet mass for V-tagged AK8 jets. And you can see uh, in the open histograms uh, the signal where we have WW or WZ. So there's a mixture of W uh, decays and Z decays there. And you can see that they both show up at about the expected uh, jet mass. And then we also have a BB bar tagger, which is specifically trying to target Higgs, going to BB bar, of course, or the case where the Z decays to BB bar. Uh, and once again, you can see the uh, peak from the Z in the, the signal with the WZ final state and the peak from the Higgs in the WH final state. We do also use the uh, B tagger for the AK4 jets. So we have a total of four different taggers, and that gives us a lot of different combinations uh, of tagger requirements that could be possible. And that's kind of the, the way that this analysis is done. Uh, we take all of these different possible combinations of require these tags on this jet, require these tags, but not these tags on this other jet, 
and that allows us to define some of these combinations of tagging requirements as search regions, and it also allows us to define others, particularly with uh, vetoes of certain tags, uh, to be control regions to estimate backgrounds or validation regions to check our background estimation. The first division that we make, though, is based on the AK4 B tagger. Thank you. Uh, so the B veto region is where we require there to be no AK4B tags. So this is sensitive to WW and WZ final states, but not really to the WH final state where there are B jets. Uh, and we're going to use the W and V taggers here. Uh, our main background in this data, uh, this region uh, comes from events that have either zero real bosons or only one real boson, which we call our zero resonant and one resonant bosons. Uh, and we derive the estimations of those main backgrounds from control regions that we've defined by vetoing the W tags and the V tags in various combinations. And then we bin this search region in missing PT. And you can see from the plot on the right that we don't see any excess in the data above the standard model backgrounds. Then we also have a B tag search region. So one B veto and one B tag search region where we require at least one AK4 B tagged jet. Uh, and now because we do have B tags, this is going to be the region that's sensitive to WH and also has sensitivity to WZ. Uh, so here we're going to use the W tagger to try to tag the W and the BB bar tagger, of course, to tag the H or the Z. Uh, and because we have bottom quarks here, uh, backgrounds from top production start to become pretty significant. And so we have two separate sets of control regions. Uh, one is uh, using vetoes of the various taggers to define the control region. The other control region, which is specifically for constraining the top background, uh, requires one charged lepton. So again, then we bin this in missing PT and we look in the data and we don't see any excess above the expected background. So we set our limits. Uh, we have a variety of different models that we've considered. I'm only showing uh, kind of two of them here. Uh, so this Limit plot is showing the limits uh, where we've actually combined charging no pair production and charging no neutral eno production under certain assumptions about how much of each should appear. Uh, and then the red line is the observed and expected limit for the case where the NLSP neutral eno, the second neutral eno, decays to a Z and an LSP. And then the blue line is for the case where the NLSP neutral eno decays to a Higgs and uh, an LSP. Uh, so if we again go to the nearly massless LSP limit, uh, we can exclude uh, in LSP masses, whether Chargino or second neutralino, uh, up to 870 GeV for the Z case or 960 GeV for the Higgs case. Okay, so then the last analysis that I'd like to present is a Higgsino pair search. Uh, so we produce two Higgsinos, and they decay, of course, to each a Higgs boson and an LSP, where that LSP might be a Goldstino in a GMSB case or a Lightus Neutralino uh, in an Electroweak case. Uh, and then we divide the search up according to the uh, PT of the Higgs boson, which is governed by the mass splitting between the Higgsino and whatever uh, sparticle it decays to. So in the case where we have uh, low mass splitting and low Higgs PT, we can resolve the two B jets from the Higgs decay as AK4 B jets. If it's at high PT, high mass splitting, then we have a uh, merged AK8 jet with both Bs uh, in the AK8 jet. Uh, so the, the whole analysis is split up this way. We, we have two, two different selections with missing PT, no charged leptons and jets. Uh, either four or five AK4 jets for the low PT case or two AK8 jets, for the high PT case. And then we have B tagging algorithms for the AK4 jets and B tagging algorithms for the AK8 jets to try to reconstruct our Higgs candidates. So then we divide up our events among various search bins according to the number of Higgs that we reconstructed, uh, the PT of the bosons, whether, the, whether it's the high PT case or the low PT case, uh, the missing PT, and uh, then also the largest separation between digets in the, the resolved case. Uh, again, we estimate our backgrounds using control regions and simulation. Uh, for the low PT case, it's dominated by top production. For the high PT case, <coughs> excuse me, QCD is also important. And again, we have no more than perhaps a modest excess in one or two bins. 
So we proceed to set some limits. Uh, so for electroweak production, which was the center uh, Feynman diagram, uh, that's the, the plot in the middle there, uh, we actually turn out not to be able to exclude any masses uh, for that model. But then for the gauge mediated model with the uh, Goldstinos, uh, we can exclude Higgs Eno masses between 175 and 1025 GeV. And then for the case where we're actually producing uh, gluinos strongly, we can exclude all the way up to 2330 GeV. And these are the strongest constraints on Higgsino production from CMS so far. So just to briefly sum up, we have a hadronic stop search, which is a nice improvement of about 200 GeV. Uh, we have a charging neutralino search, which is the most sensitive to date for the boosted phase space using deep neural network taggers. And we have the Higgsino pair search, uh, which combines two different phase spaces and gives us very strong constraints on the gauge mediated model and the strong production model. Uh, so the fact that these are, are very strong results shows us that the hadronic final states are and will continue to be a critical part of the experimental hunt for supersymmetry at the LHC. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, John, for this nice and interesting result, uh, results from the hadronic CUC searches from CMS. Um, do we have any questions at this moment? Okay, if nobody else has one, then I might ask one uh, to go back. If, uh, Jordan is actually asking now. So maybe Jordan, please go ahead. Sure. Uh, I want to ask, well, not really about the analysis, but maybe about the taggers. Um, so I think on slide four, you were talking about the top tag and the W tagger. Uh, can you yes. clarify if the top tagger uses any information from your W tagger or if they are kind of two separate things? They're two separate things. So is there any reason why you have basically no efficiency for your W tagger below 200 GB? Just absolutely no. So the, the W tagger is a, a merged tagger. So it's specifically trying to tag the case where the, the W has enough PT that it's, uh, that it's decay products wind up in a single large jet. And below about 200 GV, there's just not enough boost for it to do that. But you have sensitivity for the top, right? So the top is heavier than the W. So how can you be sensitive to a top at say 150 GB, but not the W? Uh, because we have the two uh, top taggers. So uh, if you look at the, the left plot, the merged top tagger, its efficiency dies uh, by about 400 GV. Uh, and below that, the resolved tagger that's looking for three uh, normal radius jets uh, is what takes over. Uh, yeah, I'm misreading combined and merged. Sorry about that. Ah, of course, of course, no problem. Yeah, I wanted to ask a question actually, again, somehow related to daggers on slide 14. I just wanted to see, because you mentioned that you had here also a resolved and a merged case. I was just wondering whether you could point out uh, where the merged and where the resolved Gays are actually the most important. Uh, what is their sensitivity? I'm not actually sure about that. Uh, well, I mean, okay. In general, the the merged case is going to be more important uh, with larger mass splitting, larger delta m. So, in the the electroweak case where we have a two D plot, it's going to be more towards the right side of the plot, and the resolved case will be more important more important towards the left side. Uh, for the other two where we only have a one dimensional limit curve, limit plot, uh, I'd have to give that some more careful thought. I suppose it depends on the, the mass of the Goldstino or the mass of the LSP for the, the strong production case. Okay. Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks for a very nice talk. And I think we have to slowly move to the next uh, speaker, which in this case uh, is Jordan, who's going to talk about uh, Susie searches from Atlas. So uh, thanks a lot, John. Uh, yeah. Yeah, let me go ahead and share my slides.
Do you see them yet? No, it, start, it says like you started screen sharing, but it's not showing up yet. And now it's there. Okay, so you can get started. Okay, so I am talking about this with supersymmetry. I will admit that I've changed my talk quite a bit based on the plenaries from yesterday. So um, we're going to try and see how far I can get through this talk. Um, just a brief introduction that at least with my sort of Susie hat on in Atlas, that I am one of the sub conveners for the summaries group. So I focus a lot more on these sort of big pictures within Susie, such as PMSSM or sort of global fish or combinations. And I wanted to try and give a brief overview of some of the work towards that today. So I will talk about, you know, new physics inspired by Susie and primarily RPC. There will be a little bit of a strong influence, a little bit of third generation, but it'll focus a little bit more on the electric week today. And of course, as you can see in the picture over here on my left or right, depending on how you're looking at me, we're not entirely sure where Susie is hiding right now, but uh, we're doing our best to try and uncover all the different rocks. So of course, uh, you've already heard a little bit about Susie, so I won't cover that too much. You know, just to say that there's a predicted super partner for every fermion or boson in the standard model, and they have nice names such as neutralinos and charginos and winos, binos, quarks, gluinos, and so on. So the first thing I want to mention is that at least in Atlas and CMS, particularly, you know, we talk about what we call simple models. Normally. If you look at MSSM, we have something like 130 or 140 parameters for this sort of entirety of SUSE, but this is a little bit hard for us to be able to do any sort of searches on. So we kind of try to simplify this down to a few mass parameters, for example, which you can kind of see here on the bottom, such as this Feynman diagram I'm showing here from our ElectroWeek soft two lepton search with an initial state radiated jet here. And you see these two leptons in the final state. In this particular case, this is you know, reducing you know, uh, your 130 parameters down to three or four mass parameters, such as the masses of the Fixino, Reno, and Bino, for example, and trying to make this a more simple model. The benefit of this is that we're able to design a search that can be orthogonal because we can look at different simple models and then it's easier for us to combine those searches and we interpret this with alternative models. This is generally a very good pro for a lot of theorists. The con though is, you know, as an experimentalist, this is probably not something that is actually very physical, meaning, you know, can I actually expect that nature gives you 100% clean decays and Susie. Anyway, that's my little spiel here, so I'm just going to kind of move on. Um, so in all the search I talked about today, there are, you know, three primary variables that we as experimentalists tend to discriminate on, such as, you know, how much met there is in the event, which is, you know, related to how many neutralinos there are, assuming you have, for example, IPC, a stable LSP where the LSP doesn't decay, and so that's treated as missing to it with momentum. There's also energy scale, such as you know, the amount of hydronic energy in the event, as you saw in John's talk, where you're basically looking at jet plus mate. And then there's also what we call energy structure type. And this is something that I kind of call sort of the jigsaw-like variable that we've been seeing a lot more in SUSE as well. And these are the three different kinds of variables that we really look at for SUSE. And then finally, I'm just gonna show a lot of different exclusion curves really quickly. So I just drew a quick cartoon. You have this yellow curve here, which is the sensitivity for analysis result. Anything below this curve here is where we've tried to look for Susie, but we couldn't find it. And then there's usually phase based regions, such as a boosted region right up here, and then a compressed region all the way at the top. And this just is talking about the amount of energy given to the sterner model decays of those particles based on the mass splitting between the x and y axis. There's an alternative version of this plot here where the y axis is just the delta m, which is the mass splitting between two different particles in the event. So given all that said, we're going to go ahead and dump, just drop right into the analyses I want to talk about today, three different ones. The two lepton zero chart, the uh, three lepton analysis, and the solved two lepton analysis. I'm going to give a brief overview on these three analyses just to remind everybody what they look like. 
But then I want to kind of focus on the combinations and sort of global fits that we can do with these analyses. So first, the two left tiles here are analysis. You can kind of see some Feynman diagrams here at the top left. This particular analysis uh, you know, uh, looks at leptons, neutrinos, there's an LSP, a neutralino, and a chargino. In particular, it's basically a direct lepton search here where you get two leptons plus met for your final state. There are three different signal scenarios shown here. The direct lepton is this first one, which you see, but then there's some other Feynman diagram, which gives you, for example, uh, diboson variation, or you get leptons, neutrino variations as well. Then above me is just a data MC selection just to show what the signal region kind of looks like in the uh, two lepton of different flavor, but it's just a just signal region. The big, big challenge here is just basically estimating theories, uncertainties of the diposon. But the result here, what you can see on the right hand side here, we have run one, we get sensitivity about 350 GeV, and in run two, we can kind of double that up to about 700 GeV. What's nice about this result is that we can use this in a G minus two global fit, which I'll talk about a little bit later in the talk here. Now, the next analysis I want to talk about is the three lepton analysis. Now, this is actually a pretty big paper, it's something like 65, 75 pages because this is covering a lot of different signal scenario. I want to focus primarily on the Reno Beano and the Hexino signal scenarios that we have here, which you can kind of see in what I try to summarize on the left hand side of this slide. Um, try not to read this into too much detail, but it's a high level overview, which is showing that the signal scenarios are just based on how the M1, M2, and mu. Uh, parameters of the MSSM are being defined in the simple model. The particular interesting part about this analysis is that because we have three leptons in the final state, and you can get down to sort of a small mass splitting between the trigeno and the neutralino, this means you are starting to get into sort of somewhat soft leptons, which means that the electrons and muons that we're reconstructing in the atlas detector is starting to have poor reconstruction efficiency at lower energy, which you see here at the top slide. And then the bottom part of this is just showing you what the C plus stress efficiency is here because we're also getting fake leptons as well. So this particular analysis has a lot of results. I wanted to highlight the Hexenu result, which you see here on the right hand side. I'm also showing you the Reno Beano result here on the left. But the Hexenu result in particular is going to be important and you'll see here that there's a couple of different curves, but you can kind of look at this uh, uh, this solid red curve here, which is the observed limit. And then this dashed black curve here, which is pretty close by, which is the expected limit. What you'll notice here is on the y-axis is the mass splitting between the NLSP, the next latest supersymmetric particle, and the LSP, in this case of the hexino or the Reno-Bino. But you can see that the three lepton gets down to about 12 ish GV or so. It's pretty good sensitivity. But you also have an orthogonal search here that allows us to get smaller in delta M. This allows us to get even lower and get a better reconstruction efficiency with these very soft leptons, which you see here on the very top slide. We can kind of ignore this bottom plot here. I'm putting my face in front of it on purpose because we don't really need to look at it. But if you look at the top here, this is the reconstruction efficiency we have for the soft two lepton analysis, which actually allows us to get down to about two or three GV in the lepton PT. We can use this to actually reconstruct the two leptons that we have in the final state from this C prime decay that you're seeing here, for example. And so again, we're talking about the same dominant background. We're talking about having these fake or non prime leptons as well, that we need to do the estimation of very similar. But this analysis is two lepton and not three lepton. And so that's where the orthogonality of the simple model comes in. What's really, what I really like about this analysis is that it gives us two different interpretations that I wanna talk about. First, we have the 16 over interpretation that I'm highlighting here on the right hand side. There is also a Reno Beano, but I'm not going to show it. It's in the paper. Feel free to read it. I'm showing the Hexino because I showed the Hexino for the three lepton to kind of 
or shadow that we can combine the Higgs signal from the two lepton with the Higgs signal from the three lepton into a global combination. On the other side of this, we have the sort of lepton fit this lepton interpretation that we can combine with the two lepton zero jet in a to understand our sensitivity to the G minus two results from Fermi lab. So all of that said, let's go ahead and talk about combinations of global first during the last five-ish minutes or so that I hope I have. So first, the statistical combination. I've been hinting at this, but I wanted to put both models on the same slide just so you get the idea. You see here in purple, both the three lepton and the two lepton are talking about a trigeno, neutralino, hexeno, or winobino, where you have WC on the left hand side and the purple block. They're exactly the same. What's different is the signature, which is in the orange box here. And the signatures either we have three soft ish lepton or two soft lepton. Um, these signatures are orthogonal for the same model, which means we can do a combination and make stronger conclusions about the particular model that we're talking about here. And so that's what I'm showing you here. And just to remind you what the summary plot here is for the uh, Chargino Neutralino on the left hand side. But you can see if I move out of the way a little bit, you can see the three lepton at the top and the two lepton on the bottom here. And we can do a statistical combination for Winobino on the left-hand side and Hixino on the right-hand side here. And you can actually see the different, I'm gonna talk about Hixino primarily, but you can see the orange curve here is coming from the compressed analysis. The blue curve here is coming from the three lepton analysis. The red curve and black curves are the combination of the observed and the expected between the two. And that's the statistical combination. And this is actually published in the three lepton paper as well, the 75 page three lepton paper. As I said, there's a lot of different analyses involved. But this combination is very exciting because it allows you to give you a sort of a uh, bigger picture of what our sensitivity is to Hixino or Winobino model, where we have a Trichino Neutralino to WC. So that's a very nice statement that we can make here. Now, the other thing that I wanted to talk about is G minus two, and this is what I call sort of the global fit picture. And this is where we take some sort of non LHC analysis or you know, some astrophysics experiment, or say in this case, Fermi lab, we want G minus two experimental result. In this case, we're actually taking the combined result between both the Brookhaven and the Fermi lab result, which you see here on the top right hand side from April 27. And we're taking the, uh, the red point here. The red point here is the, uh, sorry, the red point here is the Fermi lab result, and the purple down at the bottom is the experimental average. What we're doing is we're taking this experimental average and we're saying, okay, let's assume the experimental average is actually where we expect the G minus two result to be. So then can we take PMSSM, generate a bunch of different models, determine which of those models gives us those experimental results, and then overlay them on top of our two lepton search analysis and our soft two lepton analysis both of them with the slepton interpretation and understand our current sensitivity to that observed experimental result from Brookhaven and Fermilab. And that's what you see here on the left-hand side. And so on the left-hand side, we have solid fills, solid contour fills. The yellow is the two lepton zero The orange is the compressed analysis, the grayish, the dark grayish is the LEP, the LEP excluded um, missile. And then anything that has these sort of hatch lines going through are PMSSM model parameters for different tan, beta, mu, and M2 values, which gives us the right experimental value for G minus two. And as you can see for the whole spectrum of basically 10 beta mu value, we can kind of say G minus two is everywhere in this picture. But what's really nice is that actually the minimum and maximum sort of roughly of where Susie can be for the 10 beta mu combination 
fit in this little plot that I'm showing here, which means that moving forward in run three, Atlas and CMS can try to cover more of the space based on I'm showing here and really help understand what's going on with G minus two, for example. So that's a very nice, exciting result of basically being able to do a global break. And at this point, we're kind of at the end of my talk. I am obligated to show the source of summary plots for all of SUSE, even though admittedly, I didn't really get the chance to talk about, say, Gluino Squarks. Um, but you can see these are the updated Gluino Squark summaries from last year. But then we have, you know, the C1 and 2 C1 C1 summary plot, which were updated a little bit more recently based on the three lepton and the solid two lepton result that I showed previously. We also have these Gluino summaries for where we have, you know, a Graviton or a GMSB model or an Orhadron. And then finally, this is sort of the global uh, summary plot that I'm just flashing here. But this gets us to the kind of the conclusion, which again, you know, a lot of our focus or a lot of my focus in particular, we're trying to get ready for, you know, one three of the LAC in March, May, June, July of 2022, sometime this year. Uh, depending on COVID and all the schedule delay, it'll come when it comes. But already we have a pretty robust SUSE search program, and we're in the process of trying to do these sorts of combinations of global pairs and understanding where all the rocks we've covered or uncovered are so far. But, you know, that's where we are today. It's pretty exciting. Thanks a lot. Uh, very, very interesting, really nice talk. I mean, I really liked also the work on the combinations and everything. Um, are there any questions at this moment? Otherwise, I would like to actually ask for slide 19. Um, yeah, so here you show already the G minus two. Have you actually already tried also to add uh, more other, uh, so on slide, yeah, more other constraints and stuff to see whether, you know, like we can even pinpoint more where to look further and stuff because, okay, this gives us a, a mild constraint, but, you know, uh, maybe if we combine this with some of the other interesting results, we can actually even pinpoint even more. Have you guys been looking? Wait. Oh, sorry, it's my dog. They're barking at the bench people who are here. I'm at my parents' house. But yes, I think I understand what you're saying. So um, this is kind of part of the PMSSM effort. We're trying to incorporate some of these other constraints, such as, say, the dark matter constraint with the relic density. Um, this is not something that we've included in this plot on purpose because there are still questions we're trying to answer or at least understand how all of these things interact. For example, you see here that with these muon results that we're showing here, we have a Bino-like LSP. But as I'm sure theorists are able to recall, a Bino LSP generally is overabundant in dark matter. You need to kind of mix it or temper it a little bit. I guess maybe temper is the wrong word, but I'm not a theorist. Uh, with something like a Shixino or a Wino, where you have something more like a Wino Bino in order to get the right dark matter relic density here. I do agree that this plot on the right is preliminary in the sense that it's probably not going to be the complete picture given it's something that's going to be more physical, combining all the different, you know, standard model or standard model like constraints that we would like to apply here, but is a first pass. And I'm hoping that we're able to present something more concrete in the future so that we can be a little bit more precise about where we want to search. Thanks a lot. Yeah, no, that would be very, very interesting. Um, I see also a hand raised from Marco. Marco, please go ahead. Yeah, hi, hi, Jordan. Th thanks very much for the nice talk. I enjoyed the, the global fit part. Uh, but I had a very simple question as a non expert on slide 10, please. You showed there uh, the, uh, the the gray contour uh, labeled run two is is that just a partial run two result or, or what's the relevance of this gray contour yeah so that is actually the first iteration run two meaning the 36 inverse from combined result being overlaid there 
on the right hand side. So this is just showing, there's two things. We're showing that one, if you look at one one, we've got the improvement from one one to the 36 inverse from device for about, you know, 350 GV to about 500 GV. But then when we use the full data set, we can go from about 500 to 700 GV. So it's kind of these iterative improvements which I'm showing here. But the G minus two global fit interpretation uses the full one two result rather than an intermediate result. Okay, thanks very much. Okay, thanks a lot, Jordan, again, for the very nice talk and the interesting answers. And so I suggest that we move now to the final talk from the session, which is Ryan on the electric SUSE results from CMS. So Ryan, if you can share your slides. Uh, sure. Okay, we can see it and we can hear you. So please go ahead. All right. Can you still see in this mode? Yes. OK, great. So I'll be uh, talking about uh, searches for SUSE and leptonic final states with uh, CMS. Um, and I think it's actually a great compliment to Jordan's talk um, because that was a great overview of the big picture. And I really want to focus on some interesting details um, in several recent searches from CMS. Um, and these kind of fall into two categories. Uh, they're mostly electroweak eno searches. Um, and within that, there's uh, some inclusive searches with really broad coverage over uh, lots of phase space, including a multi lepton search and a targeted search for uh, WH. And then there's really um, another set of searches that are targeted for really specific challenging kinematics, um, including the, a soft lepton search and a search for uh, stealth uh, stops in the, in the top mass corridor. So um, the first one I'll talk about is the, the multi-lepton search. Um, this search really covers a ton of different categories. There's 13 different um, final states considered. Uh, it's kind of like the Swiss army knife of the SUSE searches. Um, but you can see all of these categories are really important. So for example, you. If you have uh, chargino neutralino production with a decay through a W and Z, you can easily get three uh, light leptons. If you produce two neutralinos, you can uh, easily get four leptons. And if you have some more complicated um, decay chains with leptons, um, you can do all sorts of things where you, you break the, the mass spectrum or the flavor spectrum. Or and if you have um, tau, Stau's, uh in your spectrum, uh, you can actually preferentially decay to tau. So you need all sorts of bins for the number of taus, number of leptons, number of uh, Z pairs. Um, so you really need to cast a wide net to catch all of these different models. Uh, today, I just wanna focus on the three light lepton final state, which I think is most interesting. It's really sensitive um, to some of the most important models uh, like this WZ mediated decay or slepton mediated decays. Um, but there's a large background because um, this looks like standard model WZ. There's a lot of good variables you can use to enhance the signal, basically forming different masses out of, or transverse masses out of these objects. But the challenge in this kind of search is that if you're considering this whole mass plane in the mass of the LSP and the mass of the Chargino neutralino, there's a huge variation in kinematics. If you um, have a large splitting, everything is much more boosted. If you go approach the diagonal, you have much softer products. And kind of the traditional way that we approach this in CMS is to do kind of an exhaustive set of binning to cover this whole phase space um, using all of our favorite variables. And, and we do that and it looks um, something like this. You get this multi-dimensional space um, and this transverse mass of three leptons, the missing energy, HT, and so on. This totally works well, um, but you can see it quickly gets really complicated if you wanna maintain efficiency across the whole plane. Um, and it, you can't really optimize it for um, each mass point. And remember, this is just one of 13 categories in this analysis. So what you really wanna do is simplify this. Um, and I think we found a really nice way to do that in this analysis uh, using uh, deep learning and kind of, 
the ideal sensitivity case, what you would have is a you know a neural net for every model, um, but it's just not feasible to do that in terms of the statistics for the Monte Carlo or the computing resources or the, your attention to be able to do that. So the key innovation here is called a, a par parametric neural net. And the insight here is that most of the signal variation um, across this plane is just driven by the mass splitting. So what you do is you take a single um, neural net for, the, for one topology, and you train it with this mass splitting as the endpoint, and it can considering all of the different mass points simultaneously. And it basically learns how the mass splitting drives the, the correlations of the other variables. Um, and then at the end of the day, you just evaluate your, your neural network at a specific hypothesis to do the interpretation. So the bottom, the bottom line is that um, you basically have a single neural net that is able to leverage the full Monte Carlo statistics. Uh, of your, your scan, um, and you get really good results from this. Um, it kind of goes without saying that we, we don't see a sign of, of SUSY in this search, um, but we have really good limits. Uh, you can see um, we reach with just the bin analysis beyond say 600 GeV in the Chargino neutralino mass. And with this addition of the PNN, we reach uh, beyond 650. And that kind of sounds like a small difference in terms of mass, but if you actually look in terms of the excluded cross sections, it's actually a massive difference. We get about 40% smaller cross section to 12 femtobarns, while the, the bind analysis kind of just scales with the luminosity from, from the 2016 limit. So I think it's, it's really impressive. Um, and with the addition of, of new channels, this uh, two lepton uh, channel, we're able to close this gap that was in the, the original 2016 limit for the, this channel. So this is the WZ mediated interpretation. For the WH mediated decays, um, we actually have a separate analysis for this um, because the, the multi lepton branching ratio is, is pretty small with the Higgs. So instead, what we do is we look for a single lepton from the W and Higgs going to BB bar. Um, being in only a single lepton state, it has a much higher background than um, the multi-lepton analysis, uh, but we have a lot of handles to reject this, lots of different masses, transverse masses, as well as this new technique I wanna tell you about, uh, which is uh, tagging these boosted Higgs bosons. This is also mentioned in John's uh, talk. But um, the idea is for once you get to large uh, momentum, your Higgs bosons are collimated into a single large radius jet. We have a neural net that can tag this, um, which gives you both really good background separation, but also recovers um, signal efficiency for the case where it's so boosted that the individual B jets can't be resolved. Um, so this is an example event with an electron and this uh, high PT Higgs recoiling from the, the LSPs. Um, so thanks to this improvement and lots of other optimizations, um, we made a ton of progress with this channel. We, with just the, this analysis, we reach uh, up to 800 GeV. And this is actually huge progress from 2016. It's, it's only four times more data, but it's actually a 14 times better cross-section limit. And the reason for this is related to the hydronic signature. When you're, when you're looking at these kind of softer models at low mass, that those jets are just not that distinctive. Um, but as you approach higher mass, uh, everything, all of your variables uh, become more powerful. You can do this boosted tagging. And so you kind of snowball uh, to higher sensitivity once you reach kind of some critical mass regime where you, you have better... Uh, capability to separate the signal. So I think this kind of thing inspires me that, you know, maybe run three has more potential than you'd expect just from um, naive scaling of the luminosity. So that brings us to the summary of these uh, inclusive electroweak Eno limits. Um, we reach about 800 GeV uh, with, the, with the leptonic searches. If you add in the hydronic uh, searches shown by uh, John earlier, those reach out to you know, towards a TEV, which is really incredible. Um, but I think there's good complementarity. While the hydronic ones are going for high delta M, 
the leptonic analyses really access these challenging scenarios near the diagonal um, and compressed scenarios in particular, um, which is what I want to talk about next. So, um, so far, most of the models we've been showing uh, so far are for a, a Wino Bino LSP case. And in this case, you can have a large mass splitting. So you get relatively boosted uh, decay products uh, when, you, when you're charging or neutralino decay. But kind of equally plausible is that the Higgsino, that the Wino and Bino are just too massive for to be produced at the LHC. And what you're left with is only Higgsinos uh, accessible and uh, everything else decoupled. In this scenario, you just have a set of Higgsinos very close in mass um, and nothing else. And um, this is a super hard signature. And it's actually really important because this is really what this, this would be a perfectly natural model and it would solve the Higgs uh, hierarchy problem. So how do you actually look for this? In this scenario, uh, for example, for this WZ mediated decay, you, if you have very small mass splitting here, you just end up with very soft leptons, very soft LSPs, you kind of lose all your handles. All you can do um, is look for events where you have all of this recoiling from an ISR jet um, and then you get, you know, a pair of relatively soft, lep very soft leptons at a very small mass splitting and um, a moderate amount of missing energy. Um, but it's really, it's really tough. So how do you even trigger this? Your kind of baseline thing is you can use the missing energy to trigger. In CMS, we also developed uh, this dedicated soft dimuon trigger, which allows us uh, to lower the met threshold significantly, which is really, really powerful. Your kind of standard lepton triggers just can't go this soft. Um, so you have to do something very special. But even offline, once you've triggered, it's really tricky to do this analysis. Um, you, you're trying to go to very soft leptons. Um, so you have to use um, very tight impact parameter cuts, uh, special uh, isolation cuts, uh, but at the end of the day, you can get reasonable efficiencies um, without uh, outrageous fake rates. Uh, so it's really a lot of work goes into just finding the basic objects. Um, and the results for the search look like this. It's kind of interesting. In this case, you're looking at you know, the left side of the distribution for an excess. In most SUSY searches, you kind of naturally look at the, the right tail. But here we're looking for a peak at low invariant mass but we don't see uh, any discrepancy uh, in any of the, the many categories of this search. And as a result, we're able to exclude um, really a, a lot of interesting parameter space uh, in this, the space of the mass splitting in the Higgsino mass. We reach you know, 210 GeV for a mass splitting of only seven GeV. And then kind of at lower masses, we can reach down to a mass splitting of three GeV. And that's really, I think the most, the interesting part of the search is, is pushing to smaller mass, mass splittings. Um, so it's really, um, really incredible progress uh, in, the, in this final state. Finally, I want to talk about another um, really interesting and important challenging search, it, which I call uh, stealth stops. So kind of in a normal stop decay, you would get uh, a boosted top quark and boosted LSPs giving you met. But in this, this case where the mass splitting is equal to the top mass, or in particular, um, for light LSP, if you have uh, the stop mass equal to the top mass, it gets uh, really challenging. You, you no longer have any boost from this stop decay, and your LSPs are basically at rest. You start to look almost identical to TT bar production. It's really challenging. You really want a dedicated search. You don't just want to turn the crank on your inclusive stop searches. Um, and you can kind of see a couple distributions here how challenging this is. So for example, for missing energy, uh, the black curve is the TT bar and this green curve is the de degenerate case. The stop has really exactly the same spectrum. Um, whereas, and then if you go, you know, to a little bit off the degenerate case, but still at this uh, on the corridor, you gain a little bit of this MET signature, but it's very, it's very weak. Meanwhile, if you look at this angular correlation, the, the, the difference in pseudo rapidity between the two leptons, um, 
because you have this difference in scalar versus fermionic production, you always have some handle from this, but it's um, not so striking. Um, so again, what we want to do here, we actually use the same uh, parametric technique that we uh, developed for the multi-lepton search, where we take a bunch of these weak uh, discriminators, combine them into one good discriminator, um, parameterized based on the stop in LSP masses. And you can see at the end of the day, you do get um, a very powerful variable. So that brings us to the results. Um, we're able to exclude this entire stop corridor um, using this dedicated search um, empowered by this PNN. Um, and you can see how this fits in kind of the big picture view of the, the stop searches. It fills in this nice corridor here. Um, and I didn't have time to talk about it, but this purple region is actually another tricky case. That's um, when the mass splitting is even smaller than the top mass. That's actually covered by the soft left on search. So um, yeah, with these kind of advanced techniques, we're able to really close the gaps in uh, the these otherwise inclusive uh, stop searches. So that brings me to the end. Um, we really made a ton of progress on searching for SUSY in these leptonic signatures. Um, I think the electroweak SUSY in the most vanilla case is now just now, well, it's now under stress in the interesting regime, but the Higgsino searches are really just scratching the surface. There's still lots of ways for the signal to hide. And I think these really difficult channels, that's where we're going to gain the most going into run three and into HLLHC. I'm kind of inspired that, you know, the larger data set sometimes can give much more dramatic improvement beyond just square root L. Sometimes this is because we can develop more advanced methods once we have, you know, more data to play with. And I just want to mention that, you know, besides the luminosity, when we do get to the high Lumi LHC, we're really going to have a much uh, improved detector, which will be super useful for these things like the soft leptons. Um, so thank you. Thanks a lot, Ryan, for this nice summary about the CMS uh, results and you know, also giving us some hope for Run3 and the HLSC. <laughs> uh, so I see that Jordan already raised his hand. So Jordan, please go ahead. Yeah, uh, this was a great talk. I wanted to ask about your compressed search a little bit. The, I don't know if you can say any, anything about what your future plans on are here. Uh, or what sorts of avenues you're going to do or look at to try to improve upon what you have so far? That's a great question. I'm actually not sure um, for run three. Um, I, I actually don't know. I can imagine this, the trigger will continue to be improved, but I, I, I'm actually not sure what the plans are for this analysis in run three. I, yeah, I, I do think this is the kind of search where, you know, in, in high Lumi LHC, we'll actually have um, much better capability to, for example, trigger on soft things like this with the, the track trigger with the new tracker, and we'll be able to find these much more forward. Um, so kind of longer term, I can see a lot, a lot of ways to, to make this better in the future, better actually we'll have better isolation with the new calorimeter as well, um, which is kind of critical for these, these, these cases. Okay. Yeah, I think in general, so people are thinking about the interplay between the long lift and the prompt scenarios in these cases, because you know, you're starting to have some lifetimes. So you know, whether we can play with that or, I mean, I do think there's some ideas, but uh, yeah, there's nothing concrete at this moment though. I wanted to ask actually also, uh, now I have to find the slide number, uh, slide number nine maybe. You have this nice summary plots and stuff. And okay, like, you know, this calls for basically doing the work that Jordan was just uh, presenting as well, that, you know, like you would start combining all of these final states and trying to really see whether also in more complicated models and stuff, you will still have sensitivity. Is there actually work ongoing towards that or? 
Yeah, definitely. And I think um, we expect to have public results uh, fairly soon combining um, all of these different uh, final states. Uh, in particular, the hadron, I think it'll be interesting to combine the hadronic and the, the leptonic models, mm -hmm. those searches. Yeah. Okay, if I don't see any more questions. So I think, Ryan, we thank you again for the interesting talk. And this will be the end of the session. So, okay, we went five minutes over, but I think that's uh, quite a success like for a session with six talks. So uh, thank you all for keeping well to the time and for giving us like these interesting results and uh, nice talks. So, and uh, yeah, now there's a break and I think in half an hour, there's other parallel sessions restarting. <laughs>